Education necessarily involves behavioral change. Students engage in learning, largely so they can acquire something new, information or skill, or modify something they already possess. Even without explicit acknowledgement, some type of change in behavior is inevitable. University lecturers, for their part, necessarily play a role in precipitating this behavioral change. Two approaches are most common. Nudge and think. Nudge involves pushing students towards different thinking patterns. Objectives are identified and courses structured accordingly. Lecturers who apply the nudge strategy will often look to constrain student choices. They do this as they've already predetermined the objectives and align these with both assessment measures and lecture format. Choice could prove defiant as students may not understand the objectives or they may simply reject them. Underpinning nudge is cognitive psychology. A key belief in cognitive psychology is that individuals may be rational decision makers, but this does not prevent them from being vulnerable to habits, past experiences, emotions, ignorance, and even laziness. For these reasons, Teachers should expect students to make wrong choices and should thus limit their opportunity to err. For instance, I have used the nudge strategy when imposing on students group assessment measures. Many of my students are unfamiliar with group assessment as it is somewhat uncommon in many law faculties. Others, whether familiar with them or not, are opposed to group assessment as it involves relying on their classmates an act they fear that could prove costly in terms of their GPA. If given the option between an individual and group assessment, many express a desire to go with what they already know. Since one of my learning objectives is the development of metacognitive skills in a collaborative environment, I impose this format, group assessment, on them. By eliminating choice, students are saved from past behavior or from fear. Incentives, or rewards, is another tool in the nudge arsenal. It can be provided to promote engagement. In the past, for instance, I've used slightly easier problems when assigning group assessments as a way to coax students into participation. A final important component when nudging is the provision of information. Copious information is provided at the outset to help placate anxiety, just as copious feedback is provided after the fact to ensure reflection on the implications of their actions. To date, the majority of students have expressed their enjoyment of the group assessment measures. They have also admitted, however, that given the choice, they would have opted for an individual assessment. And tellingly, if given the choice in the future, they are likely to still opt for the individual assessment. Hence, if they enjoyed the experience, I encourage them to mention this to other lecturers to encourage the spread or the institutionalization of assessment measures outside the norm of memorization and mirroring. All four strategies, eliminating choice, developing incentives, providing feedback, and promoting institutionalization, contribute to the nudge model of behavioral change. The second strategy is called THINK. Think focuses not simply on outcome, but also on the process underpinning the decision making. Similar to deliberative democracy, the belief is that there are important educational advantages to engaging with students in deliberations about education. By reflecting and discussing their perspectives, by justifying their preferences publicly, by facing supportive or oppositional views, students increase their understanding of the practice of learning, precipitating behavioral change even before the formal lessons commence. Think strategies tend to be denoted by three sequential phases. In the education phase, students are exposed to the research behind particular pedagogical methods. In the research phase, students obtain information on these methods from multiple sources, including the lecturer. And finally, in the deliberation phase, students discuss the merits of the different methods. For example, rather than simply set the assessment schedule, I provide students with multiple options. Early in the semester, they are provided an information pack, invited to query me on the options, and to do some research on their own. 
Next, they are broken into small groups in which they discuss their preferences. Once these three phases are completed, they must make a decision as to which assessment measures they prefer. To reiterate, the implication of the THINK model is that free and equal public deliberation is both inherently educational and inherently communitarian. Educational because of the exposure to divergent views, and communitarian because public debate tends to constrain self-interest and encourage reflection on the public good. David Miller has described this as the moralizing effect of public deliberation. John Smith and Stoker go into more detail, asserting that public deliberation tends to eliminate irrational preferences based on false empirical beliefs, morally repugnant preferences that no one is willing to advance in the public arena, and narrowly self-interested preferences. In this way, opinions that are raw and self-centered can be transformed into opinions that are refined and rooted in a sense of camaraderie. Both strategies present different conceptions of motivation. Nudgers see individuals as fixed in their ways, in their preferences, and even in their biases. Repeating past behavior is often the easiest path as humans, nudgers argue, are swayed by cost-benefit analyses and thus likely to choose habit over chance. A tried approach is always less risky than an unknown one. The lecturer must therefore make almost paternalistic choices to steer students to push them toward paths that are more beneficial to them, irrespective of their personal preferences. The behavioral change may not be autonomous, but outcome is the main target. There are clear strengths to the nudge model. It's low cost, easily implemented, and sensitive to the reward-punishment narrative that many people learn as children. Weaknesses, however, are also fairly obvious. First, there is little indication that the change will be long-lasting. Second, nudging may work for minor issues, but fundamental change is near impossible to impose top-down. And finally, the outcomes, since we're targeting minor issues, are necessarily modest. Thinkers see motivation rather differently. They do not agree with the claim about fixed preferences, seeing preferences as malleable under the right conditions. By creating a supportive democratic framework, one that encourages listening and reasoned argumentation between participants, reflection is made inevitable and the likelihood of a reassessment of preferences high. An important implication of the think view of the world is that an individual can detach themselves from daily life. They can consider a controversial topic not from a self-interested perspective, but as a member of a wider community. Thinkers believe that people yearn for information and involvement. They simply require opportunity. The strengths of the think model are manifold. Deliberation can target the root of the matter, making for a very focused discussion. It elicits new ways of thinking and may ultimately produce a form of social transformation. Weaknesses, however, are equally numerous. It is a time-consuming exercise that requires high levels of knowledge, both analytical and emotional, and a commitment by authority figures to accept direction from others neither of which can be taken for granted. Many lecturers, just as many policymakers, tend to treat nudge and think models as mutually exclusive. If one happens to be pessimistic about human nature, then they prefer to engineer social change through nudging. If one happens to be optimistic about human nature, then they prefer to nurture camaraderie between citizens and lean toward the think model. In truth, however, it's neither an issue of pessimism or optimism, but of strategy. Whether promoting learning or trying to change public policy, actors would be well served to make use of both models. There are times to push, just as there are times to deliberate. Or, as stated by John Smith and Stoker, to be a successful practitioner of nudge, it appears one might need to understand what makes deliberation work. To be an effective practitioner of think, one may need to understand the dynamics of nudge.